How's everybody going? Man, that was weird. Everything wasn't working. Sorry about that. How's it going, everybody? Hope everybody's well out there. All right. I'll just wait another minute or so. Probably won't have very many people here. Uh, my notifications don't really go out. Anymore, that is. Yeah, I mean, obviously the people that get here got notifications. But, you know, just based on the numbers, you, you know that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, as long as CW Brooks is here, that's it, man. We'll do a one a one on one show. That's it. All right. Okay, everybody. I'm just gonna get started on it right now. So you'll have to answer the questions for the people who show up late that say, what are they talking about? What's going on? 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 All right. All right. So in 19, on eight, let's see, August 3rd, 1985, uh, Marcy Belez uh, ran away from home. And I think she was only 12 at the time, but some of the newspaper articles thought she was 13. And uh, on August 4th, she was seen at a party around in the same town, and her parents at that time also reported her missing. I don't know why you'd wait a day to report a 12-year-old missing, but apparently that's how it went. And then on the 5th, her body was found, okay? And it was, it was pretty brutal. So what I did was I went back in time and found the newspaper articles. And let's take a look at that. So this is how it started right here. This is um, August 6th. So she was found on the 5th. It's usually the next day that it makes the newspaper. Witness sought in teenager stabbing death. Spokane police detectives said today they are contacting transients to locate witnesses who may have information on a 13-year-old runaway found stabbed to death in a junkyard Monday. The girl, who left her home in East Spokane about 8 p.m. Saturday, was reported as a runaway to police on Sunday by her mother. The victim's name had not been released this morning. Pending notification, authorities believe the killing occurred late Sunday at East 811 Pacific, a semi-industrial area near downtown. The victim's body was found about 10.20 a.m. Monday. No suspects have been identified. Okay, so they hadn't identified her yet at that point. Then on the 7th, police used dental records to identify murder victim. Dental records were used today to confirm the identity of a young girl murdered Sunday after she ran away from home, police said. The victim was identified as Marcy L. Belez, 12, of East Spokane. Her street address was not released. Detectives today said the murder is similar, the murder is similar to the June 22, 1984 unsolved stabbing death of Debbie K. Finnern, 30, of Spokane. Finnern's body was found in the 1800 block of East Front, about 15 blocks northeast of the scene of Sunday night slang. The identification of Belez was made after family members viewed photos of the victim Tuesday. 
Two family members identified the victim as the runaway, but the girl's mother told officers she could not make a positive identification. Detective Sergeant Mike Schmidt said the mother's doubt led to a decision at midday Tuesday to have the victim's teeth compared with the runaway's dental records. Authorities said the victim suffered multiple stab wounds and was found dead Monday morning in a lot among a number of disabled cars and two shacks at East 811 Pacific. Oh, here goes the dogs. Never fail. Hold on a second. <laughs> Yep, it's the mailman, of course. Darn blue. Anyways, the girl reportedly left home at 8 p.m. Saturday and was reported as a runaway by her mother Sunday. No suspects have been identified in the killing. Okay, so that was August 7th. Then August 14th, autopsy, slain girl, sexually assaulted. Spokane police detective said Tuesday that the 12-year-old girl who was brutally stabbed to death August 4th was sexually assaulted was actually, yeah, I guess it could have been August 4th at night. Uh, Marcy Belez of East Spokane was found the next day. She was stabbed numerous times, mostly in the chest. Detectives said autopsy reports showed the girl was sexually assaulted and had struggled and had struggled with her assailant. The girl's murder probably was not committed out of lust, but out of anger, said Detective Mark Bennett. He described her assailant as someone possibly angry with women and who focused that anger on the girl. We'd like to solve this case and get the help he needs. Uh, let's see. Bele Belez was lying on her side when her body was discovered at 10.20 a.m. in a lot at Lawrence Towing at East 811 Pacific. The owner of the towing firm discovered her at the rear of a rundown house that serves as the firm's office. Evidence found at the scene of the murder indicates the killing occurred sometime late August 4th in the yard where the body was found. Belez apparently was happy August 3rd because with some extra money she had bought a new dress, but she did run away. The girl apparently had left home about 8 p.m. on August 3rd and was reported as a runaway by her mother the next day. Oh, uh, well, I wonder if it, she, they just assumed she was a runaway because she didn't come back. Belez was wearing the new dress, a short lilac-colored dress, which cost about $4 the night she was murdered. Okay, and then on the 16th, you know, the police were looking all over the place. They raided a transient camp for clues uh, that was fruitless hey thank you robin frost okay so right now we're going to take a look at the press conference that uh, it's about 25 minutes long but it's parabon nano labs yet again so you got parabon nano labs and dna dope project always kicking ass out there Super work. And here we go. I'll rewind it to about... Yeah, we'll just do the whole thing, I guess. And I fixed the audio. It was really low. I, I had to boost it up like 20... Yeah, this is 1985. And it's it's been solved. So I'll, I'll pause it as we're going through this because I found all the different locations. Hey, thank you, Jody Williams. I appreciate it. Hi, Gray and Freaks. Stay home, stay well. Good eye, Mike. Uh, from the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab. And so that Sergeant Glenn Bartlett is also here from the police department. So some of those names I'll mention throughout this because they've all had a hand over the years in working on some of this. 
um, and getting us toward a resolution on this case. I can still so, turn that up a little. Spokane Police Department investigators recently sought the service of Parabon Nano Lab. Let me boost it up another like four. A DNA technology company in Virginia. Law enforcement agencies across the country use the company's snapshot DNA analysis service to advance investigations when traditional DNA methods fail to produce a match. The new snapshot service offering genetic genealogy uses advanced DNA testing in combination with innovative genetic analysis, sophisticated identification techniques, and traditional genealogical methods to establish the relationship between an individual and his or her ancestors. For forensic investigations, it is used to generate highly informative leads as to the possible identity of an unknown victim or offender. In this case, it was an unknown offender. In the investigation of the... So when we're going through this, I'll pause it every once in a while to get to my, uh, you know, they'll, they'll say specific addresses, and I found all those. What's crazy is two of the addresses, actually three of them, it's a, it, I mean, almost the entire town of Spokane is different because they're all gone. But you can see them on satellite and some older street views uh, in on some occasions. Rape and murder of Marcy Belez. Parabon submit, submitted a genetic data profile created from the unknown crime scene DNA sample to a public genetic genealogy database for comparison in hopes of finding individuals who share significant amounts of DNA with the unknown subject. These genetic matches served as clues to inform traditional genealogy research. First, family trees of the matches were constructed back to the set of possible common ancestors using online genealogy databases newspaper archives, public family trees, obituaries, and other public records, after which descendancy research was employed to enumerate the possible identities of the unknown subject. Other information such as age, location, triangulation between matches, and or ancestry and trait predictions were used to narrow down the possibilities before a final list of leads was produced. The Spokane Police Department then used traditional police work to continue the investigation whereupon Clayton Giese was identified as a suspect. Our investigators subsequently acquired several DNA samples during the exhumation of Clayton Giese's grave. The WSP crime lab confirmed the newly acquired DNA positively matches the DNA profile from the crime scene evidence. Now, by the way, they use a number that's so, you know how they say one in six billion or something. Well, th this number is so large, there's 30 zeros after it. <laughs> they said they'd never seen anybody that was such, even that, th that high of a match. Okay. So that will be covered in a little bit more detail during this presentation. Uh, on August 5th, 1985, um, and that's not my phone. The body of Marcy Belez was found at uh, 811 East Pacific. Spokane. Hey, thanks, which Mary. Time, we'll get some pictures here in a minute, which at the time was kind of a junkyard, impound tow yard. Marcy was 12 years old. Uh, she ran away from home uh, at an address at 1700 East 3rd. On okay, so her, her address that she ran away from was right here. Now, if you look, I was looking at it going, well, shit, where did she live? It looks like a building. Well, it turns out there were homes right there at... Uh, so if you go back in time on the map, on the, uh, the, the, t the time changer deal at the top of uh, Google Earth, I don't know what you want to call it, but there it is. See, there's a house right there. You see that? So it was even there just back in July, that house, okay? So uh, you, there is a, and then I went to the historical street view. I think it's, yeah, this one right here. So here's the, here's the building next to it. Now, if you can see in this little tiny window, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, there is a house there. So I'll click on that, and then there's the house. The magic of just historical street view. There's the house right there that she lived in 1985, okay? And right there, again, it's not there on that image. But if you go back, there it is, and it's, you know, it's there forever at, before that because it's, well... Not forever, but throughout the entire satellite sequence. On uh, August 3rd on Saturday, parents reported her missing on Sunday afternoon. 
Investigators were able to determine that she was last seen about 10 p.m. on Saturday, August 4, 1985, at a party at 1125 East Newark Avenue. Her body was found on the Monday, August 5th, at a vehicle tow yard, and the medical examiner pos positively identified her on August 6th of 1985. Thanks, Charlie. So again, uh, Marcy was 12 years old when she was killed. Uh, the autopsy report indicated she was about five feet tall, weighed a little over 90 pounds. Lived with her parents and four sisters at 1718 East Third Avenue, and had last attended Grant Elementary in the sixth grade. Yeah, so the elementary school, that's where she lived, right there. The elementary school is right there. So not far away, probably just a short little walk or bus ride to school, but probably walk back in, that's the north-south orientation. So lived right there, and then uh, the school is right here. So this is an overhead shot from 1985. Uh, you can see the red arrow um, near the bottom of the screen. That indicates uh, 811 East Pacific looking from west to east. Yeah, now that it doesn't look like that anymore. So the, the location she was found is right here. And uh, there was some interesting shots, uh, like in this other article here. Let me open this up. There's a video here talking about it. Let me see if I can, yeah, so there's a, you can see in that image right there, that was a, uh, I can't remember what, what hotel it was back then, but now it's a, I think it's a Shiloh Inn now. And if you look up here, I think if you rotate it around, see what angle, I, I just saw it, it's right there. So you can see that building in the background right there and a little bit of that one by looking at that shot. See, there's that building and that one. They look like they're closer, but that's just, that's how the camera was. Okay, it was set to, um, I'm not sure if it was like telephoto lens or whatever, but it made it look like it was closer, those buildings. But definitely that building and that building now, that's a Shiloh Inn. Um, and there they are right there. So, you know, if you were down low and took that picture, those trees probably weren't there either at the time. Okay, so this is this is the address too that he gave out as being where her body was found, and then there's also another shot that's in the uh, in this video. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, that's from above. None of those items are still there. Okay, right there. This this one this one was kind of interesting. See that building back there? Well, if you look it's right there and if you just kind of it's almost exactly the right angle so i think that proves that this location is that spot and i think you can almost see it let me try to go down the street view here i don't know if you can or not no nah, it's blocked by the uh buildings there but uh, yeah so that's where her body was found so again she lived here left at eight eight o'clock on the third, went to, she was at a party over here, but the parents didn't know it. Um, and she was even at the party on the fourth. So maybe, I think that's why they think maybe she ran away, but maybe that was fourth early in the morning. But yeah, it was probably fourth at night because her body was found on the fifth right here. And she'd been sexually assaulted and stabbed numerous times in the, in the neck, I believe too. That's what it looked like. That is a aerial of a closer, closer up shot of the location of the crime scene. So about Pacific and Scott is where that is. Um, the boom truck there indicates, uh, or that's the area underneath that is where Marcy's body was located. That uh, Gateway Hotel in the background, I believe today is the Shiloh Inn. They're on third, just for geographic reference, if you're looking at that. From the crime scene, uh, photograph on the upper right is the knife sheath that was located. That was matched by detectives at the time to a Gerber knife that would look like the one on the lower left. Um, like a dagger. A double-edged uh, dagger type knife that was used to commit murder. Oh, I said that. <laughs> the autopsy revealed that uh, Marcy had been raped 
stabbed 29 times in the upper torso, two times. 29 times. I mean, a little 12-year-old girl, this killer stabbed her 29 times. Times in the head, her throat was cut. The, Let me hear that again, that's crazy. I detectives at the time to a Gerber knife that would look like the one on the lower left. Um, that was the type of a double-edged uh, dagger type knife that was used to commit the murder. The autopsy revealed that uh, Marcy had been raped, stabbed 29 times in the upper torso, two times in the head, her throat was cut. Wow. The investigators were able to determine that she was killed at the location where her body was found and she didn't have any defensive wounds indicating an ability to uh, have an opportunity to, to attempt to fight off her attacker. In the very beginning, um, detectives Mark Bennett and Jim Peterson were assigned this case as lead investigators. Um, yeah, one of the articles mentioned that the, the detective thought it was a rage killing somebody who hates women. In, uh, and some of the detectives here, the supervisors will to speak to this later as well. And reviewing that case file, these investigators that had this case as the years went by did everything possible that you would be able to do in a case with the information given. And we'll cover this in more detail, but with the advent of some of the genetic genealogy that we were able to access through uh, Parabon and the help from the crime lab is what moved us forward. That just hasn't been available until recent years. So everybody that had this case did what they could do at the time. Uh, it just wasn't possible due to technology to do anything more than what they had. However, they did make every best effort. In August of 1985, the SWAT team com completed a line search from Division to Havana along the train corridor. Yeah, I have uh, some cases that are similar. And what I thought we'd do is later tonight, when I do the later show, because might, I might do another one around 6 regarding this other crazy case. But then when we do the later one tonight, maybe we can go over and try to look at some of these ones that were similar. Okay, but, he, but here's the deal. They have to be prior to 1989, okay? Because they dug this guy out of the grave to get his DNA, but he died in 1989 in a rollover car accident. Okay, and I actually, believe it or not... <laughs> I found the reference in the newspaper of man dies when car overturns on curve. A Green Acres man was killed early Sunday when the car he was driving ran off Apple Way and overturned, a Washington State Patrol spokesman said. Clayton C. Geese, 25, was ejected from the car and died at the scene. I mean, poor guy. Jeez, don't we all just feel sorry for him? 11 miles east of Spokane, the spokesman said. The spokesman said the accident occurred shortly after 2 a.m. when Geese was unable to steer his car around a curve near Interstate 90. Geese was not wearing his seatbelt, the spokesman said. So it's weird that you can just find this random article about him dying in the car accident. And at the time, it's just, it had no meaning whatsoever. It was just other than the fact that he died. Okay, people probably like, oh, poor guy, poor guy. Not knowing that just four years prior to that, he stabbed a 12-year-old girl 29 times in the upper, in the in the chest, two times in the head, and cut her throat, and sexually assaulted her. Okay, but it's weird. I mean, uh, to me, stuff like that's strange. It's just like, oh, he's in the paper. He died. Uh, identified 115 people in that area, just trying to find somebody that would be out there that possibly would have some information or could be involved contacted about 115 people out there kind of living along the tracks. During the investigation, 257 people were contacted and interviewed. So again, a substantial and monumental effort by the people that had this case over the years. Um, investigators looked at 87 possible suspects in this case. 12 were eventually cleared by DNA testing. Uh, one suspect DNA, which was the killer, was entered into the CODIS uh, system in 2002. That was what we used to match. Uh, in 2019, Detective Brian Hammond, who's here with us today, worked with the crime lab uh, specialist Bill Colnane, who's also here with us today, to submit this DNA sample to Parabon Nano Labs for the genetic genealogy analysis. Um, we were given four possible suspects to look at. 
two were eliminated uh, via DNA, and then we located uh, the fact that a third suspect was deceased. We obtained DNA from some family members of his that indicated that he would be a likely match. And so um, a couple weeks ago, we did exhume his remains and obtained some DNA samples, which uh, did match the DNA from the crime couple, scene. A couple weeks ago, wow. Clayton Giese. Uh, we've put this number up here because, and I think that some of the scientists can speak to this later. I've never, uh, I've never seen a, a match number this high. I don't even know what a no million was, um, but the match number was 1.1 no million. That's 30 zeros if you're going to count them. Um, can you believe that shit? And I'm not a scientist. That'd be so like if there was to the significance of that later. Like a hundred million, so hundred billion. Do we know about our suspect? Um, he's born and raised in Montana. At the time of the rape and homicide, he was 22 years old and lived at 3900 East 2nd, Spokane. Uh, he was killed in a one-car crash in January of 1989 out in the Spokane Valley. So this yeah, they've illustrates done that many the times. geographic relationship yeah. of the location of these things. I think this is about the fifth case that we've covered on the air where the killer was somebody that was already dead. Either they died in prison or they lived their life and died. Uh, they Remember the one case where the guy died from some kind of like throat cancer? Um, I can't remember what case that was, but I sort of remember vaguely the details. He killed somebody in a house and just got away with it all those years and then they finally uh, found him using DNA. 3900 is where Clayton Giese lived. Uh, 1700 East 3rd is where Marcy Celeste and her family lived. 1125 East Newark is the location of the party um, on that day in August. And then the Red X at 811 East Pacific is the site of her murder where her body was located. There's some of the major crimes investigators that handled this case initially, Detective Jim Peterson and Detective Mark Bennett. And then this case was also uh, handled by Detective Mindy Connolly, Detective Mark Burbridge, who is with us today, Detective Brian Hammond. Um, no doubt I have left out some names, unfortunately. I don't mean to. Um, There's a lot of other people. Uh, retired Lieutenant Jim Lundgren worked on this at times, I think, as a detective and a sergeant of major crimes. I see people in there talking about... Uh you know other cases so I, I you know when you're looking into these in, in old the old uh, newspaper archives sometimes the name of the victim you're looking up shows up in a other articles like hey this was similar and it's also not unsolved you know for example like right here uh, this is an article and her name is uh, was mentioned that it's right right here so it's saying, you know, the following day, Rochelle English, 22, was found strangled in an apartment um, on July 5th. Uh, the strangled body of Kathleen DeHart, 37, Ruby Jean, prostitute, his body was found. Uh, you know, you've got all these different ones in the same area. This one here has been mentioned twice. Uh, at the time she was murdered, this, is an, this article here was like 1987 or something. So at the time, 1985, this Debbie Finner, Finnern was also mentioned in one of the first articles about it. So I think later on, we should. I'm going to go take a look at that one and see if it's been solved. And if not, you know, gosh, they might have to check all those cases right there, right around that time in that same area of, in Spokane and see if they're related. If it's after 1989... You know, after the date he died, obviously, they're not going to be related to him. So just letting you know, I'm, I'm already going down that road, but I just want to get through this, and then maybe uh, later tonight when we do the show, let's go, let's go look into those and see what we can find. Uh, there was a number of other investigators that helped out with this and had, um, had pieces of working on it over the years, but... The detectives that are listed here are the people who were assigned this case that took significant steps over the years towards moving this forward. And I think that's an important uh, an important thing to mention. And looking at this case file, there's almost you know 20 years worth of, of work in the interim when this case was actively being worked or, or things were happening. 
uh, suspects were contacted, traveled to various states to look at you know various suspects and talk to them, travel to the other side of the state. So people were doing what they could do with what they had at the time as it was as it was moved forward through time. So that's the end of that um, part of the presentation. I think uh, probably take some questions. Yeah, there's no such thing as closure, Bridget. And, uh, you know, it would only be justice if, is if in the car accident he felt pain. If he died immediately, well, so we don't know if justice was served. If he hit the ground and he was struggling and really screaming in pain for a long time, then that would probably be justice there. But there's no such thing as closure in uh, any of these types of cases. They always use that word. Uh, no, doesn't exist. Um, I can answer some general questions, and if you have a specific question, if it kind of relates to science, I'd like to if uh, some of the crime lab people are willing to answer those, if it relates to some of the specific aspects of the case and, and how some of that stuff got done, if we can answer it. Uh, some of the other detectives and officers that are here, um, I'm going to have them answer some of those. And then I'll, and then I'll kind of close at the end. <coughs> What kind of uh, criminal background did Mr. Geeky have? He had a very minor criminal background here. Um, his database showed uh, one arrest for, a, I think, a marijuana possession charge just a few months before the car crash that killed him. Do you know if he was in that party? We don't. No, there's no such thing as closure, Bridget. Yeah, do you think it works like this? Oh, wow. Oh, God, my, my brother he was shot in the head and killed. Oh, wow. Oh, 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 Jim did it? Okay, great. <laughs> hey, you guys want to go to a movie and have a beer or two? Hey, look, look, there's never a, it never, there's no such thing as the word closure. The word closure is a joke. Okay? It doesn't do shit. It means you had an answer for a question. Uh, it allows you to kind of close the chapter, uh, you know, like the, you know, like finish that chapter. I don't even want to use the word close the chapter. You sort of finish the chapter. You'll never forget that at all. It doesn't, there's no closure whatsoever. I don't even know why they use that term. It should just be, I'm glad we were able to give them answers. And maybe now they can, um, you know, now that there's answers, they can move forward. That's it. But you never forget. There's no closure whatsoever. Um, and you'd probably only know that if something happened to you and your family member. No, I know, I know what you're saying. It's just a shitty term. There's no such thing as closure. Right? I, I know what people think they're, they're saying. It, it just doesn't do a damn thing. And they're talking about, you know, whenever they say closure, they're saying, we're glad we were able to give closure to the family. You know, what, what do you mean? He didn't give shit, you know, there's no closure. You give him the answers, though. You know, saying they didn't give shit isn't there, right? I mean, but you didn't give him, there's no such thing unless you could just magically give somebody a drug and they're, oh, wow. Yes, everything's great now. It, w it must be horrible for a murder victim's family that aren't solved for 35 years. They're literally just wondering who did it, who did it, who did it, who did it, who did it. And the crazy part in this case is that person was dead the entire, like almost the whole time, almost all of those, 30, 31 of those years he was dead. But nobody knew it. And he got his little moment of fame in the newspaper for dying in a car accident. For, we don't for a fact. So, some of the, of course, 1985, right? So it's very difficult when you go back and try to start talking to some of the people who you know might remember something and, and just going through some of the case files and the you know, detective might be able to speak to that. The sheer volume of people that were around, you know, and all, you know, we met these people at the Zips, and this guy was here, and this guy was calling, you know, this sister, you know, for rides, and we were hanging out here and hanging out there, and then going in and trying to capture that volume of people and talk to them, and again, you know, to go through 87 potential suspects and look at those people on the basis of they may have had some connection to, and that's typically what we look for, right? We're looking for the connection or the closeness to the victim of those next people out who might be the suspect. And if you look at even just recent years, you know, many 
most all of our homicides, the victim and suspect, there's some nexus to them there. And I think that's one of the things in this case that kept it from being solved without us going to some you know, extra levels with the Parabon Nano Labs genetic genealogy and, and the things that they can do with the DNA to give us back that information that we could then turn to the crime lab and go, well, here's this, now help, help us sort this part out, is that he was probably not in the circle of the people known at the time, and in fact never showed up in any of the investigative reports. <laughs> How is this technology going to help with investigations moving forward? Well, the fact that it's available uh, will help out quite a bit. The key is what evidence do we have from cold cases to be able to submit to them. Mm -hmm. And so it Hey, thanks, Miss Skiss. Missed your live yesterday crying face, listen to it today at work. You're the best Gray and Freak family, love you guys, <laughs> face blowing a kiss, yeah. beating heart, beating heart, beating heart. Yeah, well, no, but here's the thing, everybody. There are family members out there, thanks again, Miss Gis. There are family members out there that use the word closure. Oh, wow, I'm glad they were able to give us closure. But there, it, you know, in reality, there isn't one. That's all I'm trying to to say so even though people do use it even family members and everything if you use it don't worry about it. it i'm just going to always say i even said on a show about a week ago that any every time i hear the word closure i feel like i got to jump in and say there's no such thing it's like a reflect you know reflexive the way i just say it it's just kind of the way it is thanks chuck sim In this case, uh, the initial responding detectives and officers did uh, an outstanding job of capturing the evidence that was available. So on some of our cold cases, we have evidence that's pretty good. On some, we don't. And that's some of it's just happenstance by the time and the era that it was. Some of it is whether the evidence even existed to start with. Did we capture it? appropriately at the time you know 40 some 50 some years ago and is it usable if we have it and it's a value and the crime lab says that yeah this is usable and we have something here then we will be able to use that in future cases right now we have about 113 unsolved murders that go back to uh, the late 50s which is the database that we have uh, we know from you know some of the historical here let's take a look at this one though this is one that I specifically pulled aside i just saw it in my folder here this is october 1987 so two years later look at look at this one a runaway i mean you almost think we we're talking about the same case right when you watch this knife attack victim was runaway a runaway girl found dead late monday near beacon hill just east of spokane was killed in what appeared to be a savage Knife attack, authorities said. Doesn't that sound like almost identical? Right? Tony L. Howe, who would have turned 17, so another young girl, and he might have thought uh, and in the other case that uh, Marcy was 13 or 14. Who knows? You know, uh, you know, I don't know what this guy was thinking. Uh, but anyways, Tony L. Howe, who would have turned 17 last Thursday, reportedly left her home at, let's see, West 200 and... 2007-16 boom. Let's see where that is. Yeah, I don't know if that... Let's see. Wes. Let me look at that. 2007-16. Wes... 27, 27, 16, boom. No, no, it's got to be in. No, there it is. 
Yeah, so right there, look at that. That's a different case. <laughs> See, there was these other, another case I had in Spokane. But, uh, you know, it's in the general area here. Okay, let me just, I'm going to put her name on this one. Ah, we'll do it later. Okay. So it was who would have turned 17 last Thursday, reportedly left her home at West 2716 Boone on October 5th and may have been killed before her birthday, said Lieutenant Norm Nickerson. She had left her young child at the home she shared with her mother, whose name was not given. This is a savage attack, said Sheriff Larry Erickson, in describing the multiple stab wounds on the partially clothed torso. The body in jeans and bra was found in a grove of pine trees 100 yards north of Valley Spring Road, about a mile east of intersection of Wellesley and Market. Uh, Erickson said the jeans were fastened at the waist. The body was spotted Monday afternoon by a spokesman, or I mean, excuse me, a Spokane man after his car broke down in the area about 3 p.m., officials said. However, the man, Michael K. Foster, didn't call city police. And, let me see, hold on. The body was spotted Monday afternoon by a Spokane man. However, the man, Michael K. Foster, didn't call city police until about 6.30 p.m. to report the body Erickson said. Foster explained to authorities he had walked home and then was delayed in making the report because of problems at home. <laughs> I don't know, that's a little bit weird. I'm going to have to go. I bet you that one's been solved. Meanwhile, an anonymous call reported a body in Beacon Hill area, but that call may have been from someone who had heard about the sighting. Erickson at the s scene of the homicide confirmed early this morning that the body was not that of Julie Wefflin, 28, a Bonneville Power Administration, I know, I know exactly where that is, Bonneville Power Administration employee who disappeared September 16th from a BPA substation. Hmm, I guess we got some stuff to look at over there in Spokane. I'll have to take, check that out. So let me get back to this. Police department records that there's unsolved murders before that. We're probably getting outside the window of solvability on some of those because even the police technology at the time didn't really indicate for those detectives to keep what might become evidence in the future. So um, that seems like kind of a big number, but if you realize that's about 60 years worth, that's you know an average of maybe a little under two a year. And there's been some years where maybe we've had a double murder that went unsolved, and that accounts for a whole year's worth. So we have that list. Um, we are still actively working some of the other cases, and all of them have been evaluated and prioritized on the basis of how much we think we might have solvability in terms of available witnesses still, available um, evidence and ways to work at it. The, the other thing is, is it is difficult for us, given all of our responsibilities that we have currently matched with our current staffing, to do these. We do not have a cold case unit. I guess they found um, that article too. Squeezing in or squeezing out the extra work from people in their spare time, which they really don't have. They make the time, but we have, a, every day we have a constant inflow of new cases that cannot necessarily be ignored or set aside to work a cold case. So it's just a matter of kind of trying to balance all those things. Okay, here's a cold case that has some solvability. Here's the potential for it. Who has the time to work that and move that forward? And so this is a, bit, this is a good example of when we do apply our extra time and resources to it, we can make some yardage and we can't get there and come to some closure on this. To, you know, and, uh, justice in this case, maybe not the guy is deceased, but closure, I think, for the family. See? Uh, for the community. He says it all the time. For people that remember that uh, incident, people that were in the Belez's circle of, of uh, 
friends or family, certainly her sisters. Um, you know, our, our investigators have reached out to them and, you know, the department offers our condolences, you know, still as they did back in 1985. Um, so, I mean, I think that's the best result we got here is closure. So, so can this technology be used not only for cold cases, but plans to use it for future cases coming forward? Yes, yeah, certainly it could be used in... You know, the thing is, it's almost like they're speaking for themselves. Hey, we got closure because they finally closed a cold case. You yeah, know, but that's what I'm trying to say. They're not talking... They think they're talking about the family, but they don't think of it the same way. In future cases coming forward, the technology it's okay, Barbara. is, is yeah. uniquely it is what it is. Um, uniquely geared towards giving us something that traditional means don't. And so I'm not going to go too far into the science thing. Yes, everybody, stop what you're doing right now and hit the like button. As soon as it goes up, I'll hit the play button. I'm holding you hostage. But if we have DNA now, we submit it. State Patrol Crime Lab enters into CODIS. If the if the suspect DNA is already in, then we get a match, and we have solved cases that way, including some cold cases. We've had the DNA in the system, and then the suspect is you know court ordered uh, via conviction to submit it, and then we get a match, or maybe he or she was already in. So in, in this case, what we're doing is we're kind of going outside of that. And we're saying what what does the DNA say about this person's ancestry? And then they're going, well, these, these people here, going back to the 1800s and down this descent line, had these kids that would be about this, the right age. So. Yeah. You know, and there's also, they gave out the location of where he lived. So if you just kind of look how crazy this is. He lived right there on the, almost the same road as uh, Marcy lived. And then the party was here. She went to school there and her body was found there. So, you know, he probably abducted her, probably on her walk back, you know, you think, maybe. Maybe she was going to walk home. Who the hell knows? Um, but anyways, her body was found right in there. And if, as you just saw that screen grab, it doesn't look like that whatsoever anymore. Let's see. See, that's the same spot. Let's see what angle that is. There's an L-shaped building. Is it like that? I'm going to see if I can try to make out the spot. So they say it's right there. So is this just totally changed? Let me see. Yeah, it's 1995. Interesting. Doesn't look like that at all. Oh wait, maybe that's it right there. There you go. Okay. <laughs> See, there we go. It's just like that. See? See that little triangular shape of the roads? And right there, apparently, but um, everything looks different on the ground there. See how there's none of that stuff looks similar? Yeah, but I have the pin right in the right spot. These are just buildings that weren't there at the time they redid that. Okay, and then if you go to where he was located, and you go down, that's not that's actually where she lives, sorry. Where his house is, Clayton C. Guy. It's like, whoa, it's a road. Oh my god, it's just they're wrong. But if you go and check check out the, the um, Google Earth here, and you go back in time, it looks like that's about when they're starting to do some change. Look at that. See, that's in 2016. You can tell they just got rid of the homes there because they were doing some probably eminent domain stuff. Okay, so that's what it looks like in June 2017. This is 2016. And... Let me get how, let's see how far you have to go back before there's a house there. 
Yeah, there you go. Uh, this is 2011, and that is Clayton Clayton's house. There's no street view of it, though. So you can see that there was homes there, and they got rid of all these to make freeways. Yeah. So if you look at it like that, he is only about, I bet he's like a mile and a half, two miles. Yeah, 1.47 miles. And then she was found point six miles from her house. I mean, it's crazy. Look there. So giving us a new avenue to pursue in terms of who we might look at for suspects outside of the traditional criminal justice DNA type. Is that information only available if someone participates in, in those family tree genealogy online test kits, or is that something... Yeah, you know what? I'm not going to answer that directly. What yes, you have to opt in. Anyways, he just answers more questions. But I just wanted to get that out there. Another success by Parabon Nano Labs DNA Doe Project does similar work. Um, you know, Parabon is more of a corporate entity. They, you know, churn through more of these than most people do. But uh, it's amazing. You know, it's great to actually have an answer. It's crazy that he died just five years after he did it in a, in a crazy rollover accident where he was flung from the vehicle. But, uh, you know, maybe maybe when he was in the air flinging around, you know, flipping, flopping around in the air, he had a moment of, wow, this is my payback. You know, who knows? But hopefully, as he was flung out, out of the vehicle, he was still alive just for a little bit. All right, so I might come back on around 6 or so to do another uh, story that just came out. It was, it's pretty weird. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, it's a, another one of these bizarre ones. You probably won't hear about it on other channels because they just cover the same cases over and over and over again for views, but we cover all kinds of stuff here. And uh, hopefully you guys appreciate that. All right, everybody. That is it for this live. Um, I hope you guys have a good feeling of sort of what happened. You know, not, when I say good feeling, I mean like you feel like you learned something about what happened. Okay, I had, I had to explain that for the idiot. Say, did you hear it, Ray? He said it was good. You know. Yeah. Yes, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. We'll see you probably around, I don't know, 6, 6.15, something like that. All right. So, as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Two, three.